the House and Senate negotiate over the state health plan. The House passes medical liability reform and erasing one sentence earns a high-speed rail funding bill bipartisan support. Next. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Hello, I'm Kelly McCullen. Hope you're having a great weekend. The House and Senate are negotiating a deal on state health plan reform legislation. It comes after the Senate proposed charging monthly premiums for state workers and retirees with the House offering a free basic health insurance plan. This coming Tuesday, the House and Senate will begin negotiating a compromise bill to change the state health plan's fees and operations. House Republicans said a deadline needed to be reached by Good Friday. So that the state employee health plan can contact the uh, members of the plan, let them know what the uh, the plan will look like for the coming year. Senate Republicans say any new health plan changes will not occur until July 1st. The plan would like to have a couple of months to do that. We've got to print the brochures and the forms and all that with the new information. And so they had imposed, I think on themselves, that deadline. Whether it's a hard deadline or not, it's debatable. The House bill would offer a free basic health insurance plan to all state employees, teachers, and retirees while charging about $20 a month for a higher coverage level. House Democratic leaders still weren't quick to endorse this bill this week. There is not a, um, a no indication uh, that I know of of a sign off of this bill uh, from the parties that are necessary to sign off on it for it to become a law. The Senate rejects the House bill. They say the state health plan cannot afford to offer a no premium option. The State Employees Association of North Carolina is supporting a small monthly insurance premium if a new commission with state employees as members can achieve oversight of the health plan and its contract. That places Cianic at odds with the North Carolina Association of Educators who want free basic coverage. Scenic is, has obviously made a deal with some in the leadership to create this commission. They're going to sit on the commission and I think this is an opportunity for them to, they think that I guess to run the state health plan and uh, they have sold state employees and teachers down the river to do it. It's our opinion that the teachers are playing partisan politics with this and we don't understand that. To us it's about the members and the benefit that they get out of the plan. This isn't about partisan politics. The governor and NCAE have tried to make this about political parties. It's not, it's about real people. Teachers and retirees groups say a free basic employee health insurance plan is fully fundable by preserving the smoking penalty in the state health plan. But there was a whole lot of opposition to that and so we listened to that opposition and, and the current plan passed by the Senate did not require the uh, differential for, for smokers versus non-smokers. The House and Senate negotiation teams begin work next week on a compromise, but that compromise will need Governor Purdue's signature. Representative Jerry Dockham has worked on a particular version of the state health plan reform bill. He's here on the show. Thank you for being on, sir. Good to be here. Right down to the first question has been on my mind all week, and I've heard activists and lobbyists talk about it. This idea of a contract, so to speak, between state employees and retirees and state government who hired them. Is there such a thing, even if verbal, even if implied? Well, there is, and uh, you know, we, we have promised our state employees health insurance all these years, and we've provided that uh, free of charge all these years. And uh, I don't know that it's actually spelled out in the contract that, that it would be that way, but we, we are obligated to do that and very glad to do that. And uh, we want to provide it as, as free as possible to our employees and the best plan that we can give them. Now, no matter which deal comes, whether it's free or whether it's pay, I've seen two levels, uh, t about 10, 11 bucks a month, 20 bucks a That's month. That's right. Is that much per month of a premium, whether you're a retiree or an employee, enough to say the state hasn't kept its word to supply health insurance? Well, no, we, 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 uh, we do that. Uh, there are a lot of changes in the works right now with the, with the new bill. But, no, we've, we've supplied health insurance, provided health insurance all these years. And, and a very good plan, I think. And uh, when the premiums were zero, it was a very good deal. And even at 11 or $12 a month for some of the 
the employees, I think it's still a good deal when really out, out in the, uh, the uh, public private market, this policy would probably be running about $450 a month per individual. So $11 a month is not a lot to pay. As you have said in these meetings and the committees, are you seeing lawmakers who are sitting around talking business numbers, you know, bottom line, or are we talking in this political ideology or slant or outlook in regards to how to craft employee health insurance coverage? Well, uh, I think to answer that question, we need to back up just a little bit. And and actually, the General Assembly's not done a very good job at overseeing this plan. Uh, actually, when we, when we uh, as I say we as Republicans, uh, took the majority this last time, we were about $500 million in the hole on the state employee health plan, which which is not a good place to be because they look to us to pay, pay the, the claims, and we have to provide that money through the General Assembly, through appropriations. So we haven't really kept a good watch on that. And with the changes that we are making, I think that that will uh, give the state employees more, more say-so. It will give them a bigger voice in how the plan uh, actually uh, operates along with the state treasurer. And uh, I think it'll just be better off all the way around. It'll get it out of the General Assembly. It'll get it out of the politics of the General Assembly. And uh, I think the state employees will be a lot better served that way. Are all parties of this discussion and debate of the same conclusion that completely free state employee health insurance is out of the question going forward? It's just not affordable. Well, uh, you know, I would I would love to see that. I would love to see us keep the the, the premiums at zero. But uh, I think everyone realizes that this day and time, with the cost of health care, with all the other expenses that state government has, uh, we're just in a in a bad situation as far as money coming in, I think that it's, uh, they realize that it's kind of a little bit unrealistic to offer free insurance right now, and, and we're trying to keep the premiums as low as we can so that uh, it will be affordable. Representative Doggle, thanks for being on the show. You're welcome. Thank you. The House is discussing requiring local school districts to create policies fostering high school to work programs. A bill on the table would have schools team up with local businesses so students can job shadow, tour the workplace, and meet the employees. As an administrator, I often worried about students who were not necessarily in a career technical education program. Maybe they wanted to be but could not be, and they were not going to go to college, but you know, and I kind of thought, well, what's going to happen to them? Students who would sign up for job shattering or business tours would be given time to make up their lost schoolwork. Some House Republicans propose expanding the crimes for which a suspect's DNA is collected by law enforcement. The new potential crimes were a list, including assaulting a handicapped person, patient abuse and neglect, discharging a firearm into an occupied dwelling, firing a weapon from within an enclosure, soliciting minors, giving firearms to minors, and other child-related crimes. This bill would take effect December 1st. It's in committee. The electronics benefits cards that replace food stamps could be security enhanced. House Bill 734 would require benefits cards to feature photo ID and a physical description of the cardholder. Number one, it's a passive method or attempt to um, deter any any attempt on fraud, selling the cards at discount prices, um, and it's also to help reinforce the intent of the card and is get food on the table. And thirdly, it can be used as a valid form of ID in North Carolina. The full Senate has scheduled a vote early next week on a plan to fight Medicaid fraud. A 12 month program would issue some Medicaid clients biometrically enhanced Medicaid cards while outfitting Medicaid offices with card readers and fingerprint scanners. Fraudulent Medicaid transactions could then theoretically be stopped at the counter. The trial program would be considered a success if Medicaid offices reduce costs 3% per month. The House passed the Senate's tort reform bill this week. The Senate capped non-economic damages from any liability claims. The House did not agree to such wide-reaching caps. The full House considered medical liability reform legislation this week. Under it, ER doctors would be immune from lawsuits unless clearly and convincingly negligent in their medical practice. The bill also contains tort reform. It would cap financial damage awards to compensate victims for non-economic damages like pain and suffering or quality of life. Working people could receive full compensation for losing their ability to make money or salary. And I can tell you that 26 states already have some form uh, of limit. So we're actually in the majority with, with no limit whatsoever.
But Democrats and some Republicans oppose the non-economic damages cap of $500,000 for all medical malpractice cases. Representative Gray Mills offered an amendment carving large exceptions in that cap. I believe that juries should decide the cases and the value of the cases after hearing all the evidence that we should not do it as legislators sitting here in Raleigh who have not heard the case, who have not heard any of the evidence. The Mills Amendment allows unlimited non-economic damage awards for medical mistakes that leave a patient disfigured without use of body parts, permanently injured or dead. The non-economic damages cap does apply to awards for pain, suffering, loss of consortium or inconvenience. That's what uh, this amendment uh, is going to be. The reason it is so needed is because you cannot put a cap really on the effect of these egregious acts on a person's life. The amendment passed 6749 over the argument that the legislature is the appropriate forum to discuss issues of non-economic damages and other tort reform measures. Whether or not there's a cap should be decided in a deliberative body like this, free from any pity or sympathy. And if we don't have the right amount, we need to set the right amount, but we don't need to make special carve-outs for one kind of injury versus another. The House cleared the full piece of legislation with near 90 votes of support, reflecting an easy passage and a bipartisan vote. The Senate has chosen to negotiate a compromise bill on medical liability reform. The Senate is considering exempting farms from involuntary annexation procedures. No city could annex what's called a bona fide farm without the written consent of the farm property owners the farm protection for farmland would take effect immediately if this bill can be made law. A hunting authorization bill sits in House committee this week. Hunters would obtain and carry written permission of a landowner before hunting on their land. Hunting from state rights of way would be banned outright. Violators would face class three misdemeanor charges if this law takes effect October 1st. The House has approved legislation to raise awareness of and lessen concussions. Middle school and high school coaches and support staff would give player families information on concussions. Athletes who show signs of a concussion or head injury during a game or practice must be removed for the day. It's a consensus bill and basically what it does is it tries to uh, bring awareness to uh, sports concussions that are going on across North Carolina. Schools would keep records of concussions and head injuries and develop specific action plans for dealing with a serious injury. A bipartisan House bill would ensure that public schools clearly tell students what's expected of them in terms of behavior and how to treat fellow students. Local school boards would craft written policies into a code of student conduct. Students could not be suspended long term or expelled for truancy or tardiness, but they could be expelled for violating that student conduct code. The bill consolidates school punishment laws already on the books. So we end up with policy being able to develop at the local level to meet what the law says and hopefully take care of the issues that we've had in the past with lawsuits related to school discipline. Students would be given written conduct and school punishment policies every school year. House legislation could require that two-thirds of every state public education dollar be spent on classroom instruction. That bill would set into law that classrooms receive 65% of state education funding. The State Board of Education would have flexibility to meet the goal. The 65% classroom funding rule would start with the 2012-2013 school year. The House passes legislation allowing vehicle forfeiture for people who cause high-speed police chases. The run and you're done bill, if made law, would let judges determine if a person's high-speed driving while being chased by police qualifies for vehicle forfeiture. Vehicles sold under run and you're done convictions would support local schools. The bill sits in the Senate. The bill that would require the State Department of Transportation to seek legislative approval before accepting or seeking federal high-speed rail grants received an unexpected change this week. It was a change that helped the bill easily clear the House Transportation Committee. It also revealed a rift between some House Republicans. Supporters of House Bill 422 say the State Department of Transportation should earn legislative approval prior to accepting or seeking railroad grants that will build high-speed rail, yet stick the state with the long-term maintenance costs once those rail lines are built. Fiscal responsibility is neither Democrat nor Republican. 
It is a responsibility of every single legislator. This week's House transportation debate, which is the third week, centered on whether or not DOT should come before lawmakers before seeking federal transportation funding. Mecklenburg County Democratic Representative Becky Carney doesn't think so. In a 17-15 committee vote, the House Transportation Committee supported her amendment to allow the DOT to continue accepting federal transportation grants without lawmaker approval. The only requirement in the Carney amendment is that DOT officials officials consult with lawmakers. I don't know that we have proven that they've done anything wrong and, and, and um, irresponsible, um, but this just takes that process out. Some Republicans express concern that if a federal grant should be available outside a legislative session, a special session would have to be called or that transportation funding opportunity could be lost. Some GOP lawmakers say special sessions cost tax money that would be saved if DOT could maintain the right to seek grants without lawmaker approval. We still have the concerns and you know make sure that we don't lose any funding that would come to us that would be free and clear if we're not in session. I don't want to jeopardize losing money that's coming to us so that's uh, that was my concern on this amendment and that's why we I was wanting to make sure we get it fixed. Thank you. Bill sponsor Representative Rick Killian says he's drafting an amendment that would guarantee that special sessions would not be required if the DOT needed legislative approval under his bill and the General Assembly is not in session when a grant becomes available. But that amendment is still being written. Republicans say they're listening and looking for it and could restore the requirement that DOT gets permission to accept or seek federal grants. But as of now, the bill with the Becky Carney Amendment has bipartisan support. The bill is scheduled for a full House floor vote next week. Some House members want changes to rules affecting some mentally impaired defendants who face capital punishment. A person ruled severely mentally impaired when they committed their crime could not face death, but also could not claim insanity as a defense under a House bill. A mentally impaired defendant could face life in prison without parole. They cannot appreciate the nature and consequences or wrongfulness of their conduct. They cannot exercise rational judgment in relation to their conduct, or they simply can't conform their conduct to the requirements of law. Defendants who commit capital crimes while under drug or alcohol intoxication could not claim to be severely mentally impaired. A bipartisan House bill would let judges serve a full term, even if appointed to the bench midterm. The legislation would allow judges to serve until the second election of the legislature following the judicial appointment. Two legislative terms is four years. The bill would establish a state constitutional referendum to decide the issue. Hunters, you could soon purchase crossbows without a permit. Crossbows have been covered by permitting rules much like handguns, but many lawmakers have never been sure why. The state only recently opened crossbow hunting to all hunters after years of allowing only disabled hunters to use crossbows. The rule change will take effect immediately. The Senate passes legislation allowing district attorneys and their staffers to carry concealed weapons if they're carrying permits. DAs could not bring that weapon into the courtroom but carry it at other times while working. The bill saw old debate points revived on the Senate floor. I have been on this subject for a long, long time. And I read the papers and every day I cut out an article in which guns have shot maimed, accidentally killed, or caused a suicide. Not too many days go by when I don't find this. Had the good people had a gun in any of those cases, we might not have had near as many deaths. If all of the good people will lay the guns down tomorrow morning, all of the bad people will have a gun, and all of us will be more at danger than ever before. Thank you. This bill sits in the House. The bill that allows DAs to charge attackers with murder for purposely killing a pregnant woman's unborn child is sitting on Governor Purdue's desk. Ethan's law would allow for double murder charges should a person kill a pregnant woman and the child is lost. Lesser violent crimes like assault or battery would also apply. Abortions are exempt from Ethan's law, as are actions taken by a pregnant woman that causes a stillbirth or a miscarriage. This bill becomes state law December 1st with the governor's acceptance. 
A House Judiciary Committee endorses new technology to better track sex offenders who wear tracking bracelets. These new bracelets track where offenders walk and now can be programmed to determine when the offender enters a place or buffer zone where it's illegal for them to travel. Which will allow us instantly, uh, within a minute, uh, within at least 60 seconds, that they have entered this exclusion zone, for example, a sex offender in it, entering a school campus. This new technology would be issued to sex offenders by January 1, 2012. A bill regulating state campaign contributions from state contractors cleared the House Elections Committee this week. State vendors with contracts exceeding $25,000 and their employees could give only a maximum $500 per election to a candidate or a campaign committee. House Majority Leader Paul Stam says this is the right step, but it is always difficult convincing skeptics that any campaign finance bill can be completely effective. There is no conceivable bill that we can introduce that would stop all pay-to-play politics. But most of that's already illegal. That is, bribery is already a felony. On the other hand, for people who think that just any campaign contribution is a pay-to-play, you'll never convince them to the contrary. The state vendor campaign contribution limits would take effect January 1st, 2012. Senate committees are considering new regulations for roadside campaign signs. Senate Bill 315 would allow campaigns to post their election signs on state rights of way beginning 30 days before the early voting period. The rules are the sign would be installed at least three feet off the state road pavement and no closer than 50 feet from any intersection. Campaigns would receive signed permits from the state elections board or county elections boards. The Senate defeated a House bill that would have regulated helmet laws for all-terrain vehicle drivers. The bill originally lifted all helmet laws for ATV users driving on private property. A compromise left helmet laws in place for ATV drivers under 18 years old who ride on private property. The bill was rejected by the Senate. So for that reason, I, you know, I wouldn't mind if people didn't wear helmets if they got killed. It wouldn't cost us a dime. And what happened in, <laughs> what happened in um, South Carolina, the organ donor rate went up 300% when they passed a no-helmet law. So if this is going to cost this state money, I, I can't help it. I can't support this. Uh, thank you, Senator Bingham, for your, for your comments, and, uh, and I, I appreciate the um, the sentiment that you offer, but I think, I think the main question that this body and should consider is, how how far are we going to go to tell grown-ups what they can do? The House and Senate overwhelmingly and very quickly votes to exempt some coastal businesses from the state plastic ban bill. Last weekend's tornadoes destroyed a food line grocery warehouse in Dunn and a large inventory of paper bags. That warehouse serves coastal counties where businesses, large ones, businesses aren't allowed to use plastic bags. The plastic bag ban will be temporarily lifted. In 10 seconds on Saturday was completely destroyed. And along with that, along with the food and supplies were all of their paper bags. The temporary exemption expires June 30th of this year. Some Republican House members want assurance that foreign laws or foreign legal interpretations don't affect North Carolinians. Onslow County Representative George Cleveland told a House Judiciary oh, Committee that he doesn't want proceeding. foreign legal provisions applied to residents if the provision is unconstitutional in North Carolina or the United States. These include court rulings that may cite foreign legal precedent. And this just assures that the citizens of the state of North Carolina don't have to worry about someone going to a foreign law book or anything else outside of the Constitution of the state and the federal government for, uh, to protect their rights. Contracts written with international legal language must adhere to U.S. and North Carolina constitutional standards or be void. The full Senate approved allowing minors with nonviolent criminal convictions to have their records expunged. Those seeking clean records could file an affidavit four years following their conviction and perform 100 hours of community service. The petitioner would need to have a high school diploma or GED and have two non-related people vouch for their character as well as not face any court orders to pay restitution. This bill should be called the second chance bill because it allows minors who make one-time mistakes to be given a clean record through the expungement process when they have demonstrated their commitment to becoming productive adult members of our communities. 
Under the current law, a minor can have a misdemeanor conviction expunged, but not low-level felonies generally. The bill heads to the House. If made law, it takes effect this coming December 1st. A push is on to name stock car racing. North Carolina's official state sport, House Bill 333, says 20,000 racing jobs exist in North Carolina, carrying $6 billion of state economic impact. It says over 90% of NASCAR's Sprint Cup racing teams operate in North Carolina. Well, if you're online this weekend, cruise over to Facebook and make us your friend. Facebook.com slash Leg Week. We stream this show on our traditional website, unctv.org slash Leg Week. And if you have any comments or questions, email us. The email address is Leg Week at unctv.org. And you can follow us on Twitter at NCN Leg Week. That's our show for this week. We certainly hope to see you next time. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.